Hey everyone, and welcome to a new video series on my channel. So we will be diving into various different topics of paleontology that I'm studying um, in and outside of university. So basically things that I'm really interested in, and hopefully we can touch on certain subjects or aspects that aren't really uh, made into videos that often, such as Burgess shale sponges. I mean, this video isn't specifically on sponges, but we'll get into that later. Um, so this series will hopefully be a variety of things I enjoy, and hopefully you guys enjoy too as I release more videos. I'm hoping weekly. Um, so we'll be going over stuff like the Burgess shale, which is something I'm studying in, uh, I guess I'll make it one of my main fields in the future, um, as well as stuff like, I don't know, Eocene material, um, early Mesozoic life, Paleozoic stuff, and just odd topics here and there, um, and most likely things that relate to me, local stuff to BC and Alberta, all that jazz. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. Um, today's video is on Burgess shale sponges that are not sponges. <laughs> um, so I came across this really nice um, article, this nice paper on a scientific journal, Paleoelectronica, um, while I was trying to enter a uh, poster making contest. So I'm making a poster on this subject and decided, hey, why not do a video on it? Um, so specifically, it's on um, chancellorids. Um, so we're going to dive into their odd history and how their sponge look likes, but not actually sponges. Um, all of the images and the art that aren't labeled, they're all from the paper. I don't claim ownership of any of them. So um, you can see the paper name down at the bottom corner and who worked on it, Stefan and Desmond. Um, so all rights for the photos and whatnot go to them. And the three sets of art pieces are by uh, Pollyann, and that's their work. All credit goes to them. So let's dive right in to this presentation. Oh. Is it lagging? There we go. Okay, so the discovery. Uh, these fossils were found in the world famous Burgess Shale fossil site, which is in British Columbia, Canada. It's kind of on the border of Alberta and BC, the Rocky Mountains. And it's famous for having some of the first complex life. Um, so armor plating, carnivory, predators, prey items, all sorts of new evolutionary um, evolutionary adaptations and whatnot, things that help these new sets of traits and stuff um, appearing and whatnot. So we, we see some of the first groups of animals, chordates, sponges, arthropods, worms, stuff like that appear. And it was just, yeah, a very important window in time um, it's the Mid-Cambrian, so 508 million years ago, and uh, so Charles Walcott discovered these specimens and the Burgess Shale, and he actually described the Chancellorids in 1920. Um, he named them after Chancellor Peak, it's a mountain close to the Burgess Shale, and one of the sites around the Burgess Shale, the greater... Uh, Phyllopod bed, um, pronounce something like that. It had over 178 specimens collected from it by Charles Walcott. So these chancellorids were very common. Um, they made up around 0.34% of the community. Um, so they're also found at other locations, not just the Berg Shale. Um, they're found in the United States. You can find them in the Wheeler Shale, which is around the same time. Um, there's also the Bright Angel Shale, Angel Shale. Um, they're also found in England uh, in the Comley limestone. So they're, they're quite common critter in this age of rock. You can see there's a picture of the Burgess Shale 
all the different layers up high on the mountain. I actually hiked up there a few years ago and I'm hoping to get back out there soon. So what's going on? There's a misinterpretation. So Walcott described these as sponges at first. Um, he believed them to be one of the most primitive groups of sponges. And why was that? He saw these protrusions. They kind of look like um, trident heads, little trident heads covering the body of this organism. And he mistaken them for spicules, which um, are found on sponges. <laughs> um, also, sponges are very common, like very common during the Cambrian period. And especially at the Burgess Shale, there's a diverse amount of sponges and there's a lot of them. So of course, he jumped to that immediately. I mean, the shape screams sponge. Lots of sponges at the Burgess Shale are this cylindrical shape, very long. And they have that sessile nature. They don't move. They're just anchored to the bottom, just like this organism was. Um, and they have radial symmetry. So if you cut them into quarters down the middle like that, each quarter is going to look the same. Um, so that's why he placed them as a sponge at first. Um, later on down the road, uh, their true identity was revealed to be not a sponge. So those um, embedded sponge type spicules were not actually spicules. They're dermal celorites. So uh, celo celosclorites, there we go. So sclerites, sclerites, there we go. Sclerites are these hard bits on animals. Like insects have sclerotized body parts. They're, they're just hard, rigid pieces on the uh, outside of the body. And these were what was being misidentified as these spicules. Um, it was also later found out that um, Walcott he lumped three species into one group. Um, so there's three distinct species of uh, chancellorids that he labeled chancellora eros. Um, so later it was found there's three of them. Let's hope I pronounce these right. Archie as, or I've got the pronunciation over here. Archie as, as, Archie as Terella, Terella, Archie as Terella Coricea. That's the one, that's the long one right there. Kind of looks like a uh, hot dog. Um, then we've got Alo, Alonia Tintin Opsis. There we go. And that's the more condensed one down there. Um, so yeah, and if they're not sponges, what are they? Um, there's two possible answers for this. They could be uh, part of this uh, stem group of um, uh, ep. <laughs> Here we go with long names again. Epithelozoa, um, which includes silo silentrates, so silentrates and bilatrians. Uh, so this is just a big a grouping of, of um, animals. It's, it's the group animals. So like jellyfish, squid, mammals, insects, arthropods all belong to this grouping. Um, or the other option is, because that's, that's very broad, just being a stem group of uh, animals. Um, they could be more related to hulk irids. So those are a slug-like animal from the Burgess Ale, lived in the Cambrian. It's kind of like a long, it's like a meatloaf with spines sticking out of it. And that's actually related to mollusks. So these guys might be related to mollusks in a sense. Um, boop. So lifestyle, that kind of gives you a sense of lifestyle. I've kind of gone over this. They're sessile, they're stuck to the bottom. Um, they uh, kind of contract their body. Um, which their body has a big pit in the middle, like a sponge. Um, paleontologists it, it speculated that because no guts have been found and no gut content, they, they didn't feed on like large animals. They probably would have fed similarly to sponges. Um, so this is analogous feature of them where they're uh, filter feeders like sponges. Um, 
and they've got these root bulbs. So at the base, the bottom of the body, it's like this, this thick kind of um, connector. So you can see top right there, there's a plate with a bunch of sponges, or not sponges, chancellorids in red. And the gray is those uh, root bulbs. And they would use those to connect to the sediment, the silt on the bottom, or connect to like shells and whatnot, which we'll go over later. It's pretty cool. Um, they're pretty abundant. So you can see there's quite a few of them on that plate. And those sclerites on the body, those sharp trident shapes, you can see on the bottom left, they were actually used as a defense, it's speculated. So they might have used these to protect themselves from predators that ate sponges because they've got a similar lifestyle to sponges where they're just stuck. Um, animals like worms and whatnot, they easily prey on sponges in the burger show. Um, there's, there's plenty of examples of like worms eating sponges. Um, lots of predation like Aishaya, I think is a pretty common one. It's this lobopod uh, worm with legs and it's been illustrated a lot eating these sponges. So they may have had these sclerites to defend themselves from those predatory worms that may wanna make a meal out of them. Okay, so the environment, so we're getting into the cool stuff. So I'm just gonna go over some organisms that have been found fossilized with them, like in the same rock, because there's, there's so many organisms found in the Burger Shale, they're just such a diverse amount. Um, so I narrowed it down to specimens that contained these organisms like with them. They necessarily didn't like die that way. They could have been pushed by water currents or, or mudslides or whatever and buried in this, this arrangement. They didn't necessarily just die next to each other, but I think it's pretty cool to show um, just two different specimens on the same rock. So um, starting on the left, we've got a toya. It's this huge, well, it's small, but it's huge in the burger shale fauna, predatory worm. So it would have fed on smaller organisms, um, like seen in that image there. Um, there's like this tiny little cone-shaped dude. It's a haplophrentis, and they probably ate those. Um, and they lived underground. They, they had these little burrows that they would uh, pop their heads out of. But yeah, they've got thick bodies. So there's the, the nice, like iconic thick body you see there next to the chancellorid. Um, another organism, um, an actual sponge, Voxia. Voxia's, Voxia's like very common. <laughs> it's one of my favorite sponges of the Burgess Shale because it's got these branches sticking up to the sides. And you actually see chancellorids um, correlate with these a lot. They've got an interesting relationship uh, with this sponge that we'll go over, but this specific plate, I think, shows them intergrowing together, or th yeah, they're both anchored to the substrate, and then they like grow intertwined. It's like a little mess. Um, next on the the top right, we've got Iox is oxys. There we go. So that's a kind of bivalved arthropod. So it's kind of like a relative of a crab or a shrimp, but it's got this shell on its back. Those guys were very common in the Cambrian. Lots of um, arthropods with these cool heart-shaped shells for protection. But this one's pretty specific. Um, as is oxys is like uh, an iconic one. People like know it when they see it because it's got that little, little tip to it. Okay, so continuing on with environment, these guys also have an interesting relationship with chancellorids. Um, so these guys are micromita or micromita, mitra. Um, so micromitra is this little brachiopod, I think, and it's got a stem so it can connect down to the ground or rocks or other animals. And they've got these little filter feeding bristles that stick out of them. And they're pretty commonly found attached to things. Um, so you can see they're kind of intermixed with the um, sclerites. And they've got a very iconic pattern to them, these little dots covering their bodies. Um, but yeah, they're usually sometimes found connected 
to the the armor or sometimes if these guys are dead and their shells are at the bottom you will see Chan Celerids actually connect to their shells, which is interesting. They're anchoring onto these tiny little shells for support in the water column. Um, it's crazy. It's, it's like a back and forth relationship. So con continuing on this thought into their interactions. So we see that they're intergrowing with the Voxia. They're also growing on the Voxia. Um, so they can grow side by side, they can grow on each other. Um, you can see the illustration there showing, um, what, what's the little, what's a shorter one? That's the alo, alonia, kind of connected to the voxia. And you can see there's multiple fossil specimens showing these anchoring. <laughs> it's pretty cool. You can picture them wavering around in the, in the water column. Um, Maybe it might provide a little bit of, I don't know, extra like protection, but not to the worms, maybe to like larger predators, it might deter them. Um, you can see the connection down below, um, the, the stemish area. Um, some can be fatter, I guess, if they've just got sand to work with, they've got to spread out their distribution of little attachments to the sediment. Um, and then you can see down on the left to the micro mitra attaching to the spines shows it quite well, these round shells. Okay, um, Walcott specimens. So in the paper, in Paleoelectronica journal, um, you can go see these for yourself as well, but I wanted to show them because I thought historically they're pretty cool. They're featured in the paper right off the bat and it shows some of the original specimens he collected um, and used to describe the species. Um, so you can see how we could easily confuse uh, these structures for spicules. You can see there's like some star shapes going on there, uh, lots of little spikes branching out. I think those little star shapes are pretty iconic. Um, it really screams Chen Celerid. Same with the, um, the trident shapes. You can see those ones have more of like a little boomerang or a wishbone shape, I guess. And usually when I think of this species, the first specimen I think of is the one down on the left. It kind of has this feathery appearance. It's kind of hairy. Um, that instantly pops into my head. <laughs> usually when I'm like lazily drawing it, it's just a bunch of triangles, which is basically that. It <laughs> looks like that. It's probably quite weathered. You can see the zoomed in image. It's, it doesn't have as much detail as other specimens, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool to see these historic photos included in the paper. And so in conclusion, these were imposter sponges <laughs> living among real sponges. A friend of mine on Instagram, Teal, I stole this art from. <laughs> um, and so this is a case of convergent evolution. You've got two different organisms evolving a very similar lifestyle to each other, um, but no distinct correlation in taxonomy. They're not directly related to each other. And for chancellorids, their taxonomy is still a, a mystery. It's still up in the air. So hopefully one day, um, maybe more specimens will be found with organs or something that can easily be traced to a certain lineage. Um, but that's it for the presentation. Um, here are all the citations, basically where I got the images, information, and whatnot, um, all fair use or whatever. Uh, so yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this first kind of video for the series. And I really hope you guys are looking forward to the rest. Um, again, I'm hoping to make this like a weekly thing. Maybe I'll make them on the weekends or when I have time. And they're gonna be on cool topics. Trust me, it's worth, uh, worth sticking around for. Um, so yeah, I'll see you all then. And make sure to leave any comments, questions, anything down below in the comments. I'd love to hear it. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye. And I just got to hit the...